and welcome to another edition of The Full Scottish. Uh, with me this week I have Professor Kirsten Rummery, who is Professor of Social Policy at Stirling University and also the Scottish spokesperson of the Women's Equality Party. I also have uh, Kurt Bassiner, who is PhD candidate at the University of St Andrews and co-founder of the uh, Democratisation Policy Council. Welcome both of you Thank and you. thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having so, what will we start with this week? Let me think. What's been going on this week? Brexit. Anything <laughs> happening on Brexit? <laughs> well, not enough happening on Brexit, it would appear, mm. as we clock ticks down and it's getting all very, very, very close. Um, I think it's really interesting the way the different political parties are responding to that pressure at the moment. Um, there does seem to be a bit of a lack of leadership from the main opposition uh, yeah. in terms of calling up its supporters to support the leadership, but without any clear um, vision for what their alternative Brexit strategy would be or whether or not they would support a no deal or all sorts of things mm. going on. Um, and it's all very, very concerning because we do know the implications of a no deal Brexit are absolutely devastating in some quarters mm. and it's a little bit worrying the lack of political leadership that's going on. I think as you say devastating, there was a report out this week, the State of the Economy report mm -hmm. from the Scottish Government and they were saying the economy is doing fairly well right now mm. but if there's a no deal Brexit it will be catastrophic. Um, what are your thoughts on the whole thing? I agree with Kirsten, I mean one of my biggest I, 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 it doesn't shock me where the where the Tories are in this, with a, with a few with with some notable exceptions mm. like Anne Soubry and so mm. forth. But um, what I find most frustrating is is Jeremy Corbyn's continued straddle. Uh, I do find it uplifting that there there are an increasing chorus of of backbenchers and and other notable members like Choko Muna and David Lammy who have come out and said, you know. We're, we very much want to stop this mm. going forward. Uh, but I think the, the meta level, level issue is that a number of parliamentarians on both sides of the equation recognize what a train wreck this is going to be, mm. but you know, the leaders of both the Tories and Labour uh, have, have demonstrated a lack of leadership throughout the process. And I think mm. you can understand, if you look at it, if you take your sort of concern for the country hat off <laughs> and pretend that you are just a political scientist and you've mm -hmm. got no skin in this game, which mm. none of us can be because it affects all of us. Mm. Um, you can see the political game that Corbyn is playing. So he's got at least as many leave constituencies that either vote Labour or could vote Labour as he does remain constituencies. So he's never been able to come out and say, actually, I oppose Brexit because he, wouldn't, he would lose the votes that he needs. And of course, Labour Party, like the Tory Party, like all political parties, their main aim in the short to medium term is to get into power. Yeah. So they're playing a game that they think will get them into power, they think is appeasing the, both the Remainers and the Leavers, but what it's doing is leaving a really frightening political vacuum. I mean, if it, it's not just the economic impact of No Deal Brexit. If you look at all the stuff that's coming out about the impact on the NHS, medicines, the impact in my section, the higher education exactly. sector, mm. the research funding that we're already losing, the fact that free movement of people, you know, this has all been, Brexit has all been, right, we're going to end free movement of people. That means ending my movement into Europe, but yes. it also means ending really good researchers' movement into exactly. the higher education sector, which is why the higher education sector is vastly opposed to this. So you're saying that you're finding that that's happening already? It is happening already. Okay. So I've got colleagues who, um, from the EU, who are uncertain about what's going to happen in the mm -hmm. future and therefore not renewing their contracts, going yeah. back to their home countries. I've been turned down for research funding bids that are EU-focused, not yet because the EU EU funding has gone, but because of the uncertainty yeah. right. of what's going to happen in the future. Now, we punch above our weight in our sector. You know, in the UK, we are an English-speaking country, but we have access to 28 countries' worth of researchers and ideas. We take ourselves out of Brexit, we will absolutely lose that edge, and that's going to have not just a short-term impact on the economy, but a very long-term 
impact on the economy. And the most frightening thing is that all of the people who are pro-Brexit don't seem to have an alternative plan. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to know what it is they're voting against, what it is they really don't like about the EU. What has become really obvious over the past two years is they have no idea how the EU functions. Uh, they have no idea how to negotiate with the EU. Um, and so we're absolutely at a sort of point in which the, the future is very, very uncertain and markets don't like that. So mm. our economy might be doing fine at the moment, but it's mm. certainly going to have an impact. And of course, as a feminist, I know that the impact is going to be on disproportionately on women and mm. disproportionately on the poor as well. It's interesting to have both of you here, both of you are academics, and you're saying that it's already had an impact mm. on you're trying to get funding and some of your colleagues are leaving. Are you finding the same at the University of St Andrews? Yeah, I, th I mean, I'll, when I sort of survey the my cohort that entered the PhD programme, uh, you know, a number of them, at least five of them, were EU, EU member state nationals from outside Britain. Uh, and then mm. you add to that two Scots. Um, it's going to be harder to get uh, get PhD and students across the board. Um, at St. Andrews, that's a particularly large group. Mm. Um, and it's going to it's going to make it harder to attract faculty, mm. uh, new researchers. It's it's already had the impact without it actually coming into force, and that's only going to snowball. Yeah. And, and this week, of course, in Westminster, the SNP had tabled uh, a motion to extend Article 50, mm. which would have meant delaying the process. Mm -hmm. um, and it fell, and uh, only three Labour, uh, Scottish Labour MPs supported it. Um, and that just seems, it just seems petty, you know. That's party politics. Mm. That's very much party politics because mm -hmm. uh, Labour and the SNP, of course, are very historic um, enemies, particularly Scottish Labour and the SNP, because they very much feel like they're competing for the same sort of territory. But you would expect that when Labour table a similar amendment, the SNP will support it? Probably, because I think the SNP is also playing a little bit more of a long game. Right. You know, they are thinking a little bit more strategically about how they position mm -hmm. themselves and they've always set themselves up as having the interests of Scotland, of course, 62% of Scotland voted Remain. That does mean there is a substantial minority of people in Scotland that would support Brexit. Yeah. Um, I doubt they'd support a no-deal Brexit, but mm -hmm. you've got some very hard levers in, in the Scottish uh, parties. But um, again, that is them being whipped, uh, Labour being whipped to align to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Yeah, mm. you see that with deselection. Exactly. Mm. So there's a big threat around deselection. Mm. There's a big threat, and there's we know the Labour Party is in itself split mm -hmm. along myriad factions, but particularly along the pro-Corbyn, anti-Corbyn uh, lines. And all this, I mean, the, and the Labour Party is fantastic as a party for doing internal politics before it thinks about anything else. Um, and sometimes that works, but most of the time that doesn't work. Mm. And I would say that we are. And without being too dramatic about it, we're in a time of national crisis. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to play party politics. This is time to mm -hmm. think about what is in the best interests of the country. And if we have to do Brexit, and obviously I'm, I'm revealing myself as I would rather not do Brexit, but if we're going to do Brexit, a no-deal Brexit is absolutely catastrophic. And Corbyn and the Labour Party are leading us there just as much as the Tory party mm -hmm. are. And they're both, I mean, I agree with Kurt, there's a complete lack of leadership there and a complete lack of strategic vision. I don't think either side, apart from the SNP, who've got quite a clear vision for where they're taking Scotland, none of the other political parties have a clear vision at all. And they're not communicating that to the electorate and they're certainly not communicating that to their parties. Yeah, probably because, as you say, they're, you know, they all have to straddle this thing where they've got, they've got their pro-Brexit constituencies and their anti-Brexit constituencies and yet there's evidence that if you show leadership and simply say this is what we believe, these are our values, mm. uh, that people respect that even if they don't agree with you. But if you contrast it with the complexity, for example, of the Scottish referendum on independence, there were very clear lines 
And people, although, you know, um, and, and the SNP and the Greens historically took, us, took them from around 20% to 45%, and that was because they had a very, very clear message, mm -hmm. and people could understand it, and it was a more positive message. Um, this, in contrast, we've had a, a narrower margin at the beginning of the referendum, and I think it's absolutely, even academics didn't really understand, even people who had, you know, degrees in European law didn't really <laughs> understand what it meant to leave mm. the EU. So I don't think the country really understood as a whole, either on the Remain or the Leave side, what they were voting for. But what has become increasingly um, clear is that they still don't seem to know what it is that they're mm -hmm. voting for. Mm -hmm. And the parties and, and the negotiate. I mean, how many Brexit secretaries have we had? Yeah. If you mm -hmm. had a com if you were running a company company like that, it would have gone bust. So it's it's a it's a lack of strategy. And I do think. I mean, we go back to this. You know, this was to deal with internal factions fighting within the Tory party mm -hmm. and to stave off the electoral mm -hmm. threat coming from UKIP. And the entire country has been plunged into this mess because of Tory infighting. Um, so the fact, again, I come back to this, I don't blame the Tories necessarily for that, but I do blame that we, we've only seemed to have a credible opposition coming from the SNP and that's not mm -hmm. enough for the whole of the country. Nope. Kurt, um, Kirsten said there that a lot of people still don't seem to know what it was they voted for, but it's becoming a wee bit clearer now, isn't it? Because this week we've had Fly BMI have mm. gone out of business. Um, uh, I think it was Airbus this morning. Mm -hmm. We're saying, again, what we've all said, that a no deal would be absolutely catastrophic. But there have been a number of developments, and then we've seen arch Brexiteer Jim Ratcliffe, the richest man in the UK, saying that he's leaving because he needs to go somewhere where he can save a bit more money on his tax. So do you think it's becoming a little bit clearer? Do you think that's going to accelerate now as we get closer? Well, I mean, the, the signs have been, the signs have become clear over the past two and a half years, and a lot of this was predictable and predicted. Mm. Um, the, the lag time between the vote in, in June 2016 and now for this to show is, is, is could have been could have been predicted to a certain extent, but it took a lot longer than many of us, certainly than I expected for the, this economic impact to show. Uh, but I think what we've, we're seeing in both the Tories and in Labour and, and, and those who are, are for Brexit, and I think the, the honest answer is, 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 is both Corbyn and McDonnell are, are for Brexit because of a, a, for lack of a better term, a socialism in one country mentality, which, which doesn't appeal to me uh, or seem, seem logical economically. Um, yeah, I don't think, I think people voted on a, on a basis of, of not rational thinking. Mm. It, was, it was a term that we, in Turkish is known as inat, which is basically, it's usually translated as spite. But what it really means is this is going to hurt me, but it's going to hurt you more, and I'm going to delight in watching you suffer. And that's what got us Trump, too, I think. Mm. But um, in that regard, I mean, if this were, fought on, this were decided or discussed on a rational basis, uh, it would never have happened. And certainly, uh, the methodology of Brexit is not being discussed on a rational basis because anybody would be able to de determine that Britain is not going to have the, the trade leverage that, uh, that the Brexiteers purport. Mm -hmm. And that's already shown itself very clearly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a reasonable argument. That's going on. Well, I mean, so let's move from one dysfunctional set of countries with dysfunctional leaders, your words, my not mine, <laughs> um, uh, to, to the strong leadership being shown in the United States of America by President Trump. I just heard a very deep sigh there, and I think it might have come from yourself, Kurt. Yeah, so, yeah. your thoughts on developments this week? Well, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's a reflection of weakness that he, he did de declare this state of emergency, that he was unable to get a majority of his own party to vote again for a government shutdown because it was such a disaster last time. Um, where he's engineered himself into a corner, uh, but the Republicans are going to pay a price too, is uh, he's declared this emergency, which means he's going to try to reprogram funds that were already allocated um, for, for other purposes. Most likely the biggest piggy bank is the defense budget, but also from emergency preparedness and response. Uh, and this is going to gore a lot of, of, of oxes that belong to various constituencies in the country. Mm. So 
it's, it's paradoxical and kind of perverse, but also interesting to watch. This is what's finally generated the greatest infighting in the Republican Party thus far of his presidency of, of over really? two. Yeah, yeah, the, it, it took this, not, yeah. you know, separating kids from their parents and imprisoning families. No, uh, uh, Kavanaugh, uh, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. It, it's, it's finally now that this is going to hit home that, uh, that there's going to be friction within, mm. within Congress about this. So I think most people are surprised to discover that if the President of the United States wants to do something, he can't just go and do it. He has to go down no. this route. So no. do you want to just say a little bit about how it works, so that it, you know, if he wants to do something, where he gets the money, and why we've ended up with this state of emergency? Well, well Congress has the power of the purse. So, so the Congress, you know, the, the, the executive branch can propose a budget, mm -hmm. but the Congress votes on the budget. And ultimately, there's a negotiation but uh, and if you and the president can veto something, but then it could be ultimately overridden by by the Congress. So the separation of powers really limits the president's ability to direct policy on on spending, and so that's why we ended up with the government shutdown because mm -hmm. the, the the Democratic House of Representatives was opposing opposing his wall. Um, I think that this is what this opens up is a, a challenge within our third branch of government, the judiciary, over this this spending. They're they're going to number. California's filed already filed filed suit against the government for this. Uh, you're, the House of Representatives is 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 also raising this. Uh, they're going to pursue this in the courts. President Trump already admits he's going to face legal challenges, and this probably will end up in the Supreme Court. Which he's hoping that his two his two new justices will help tip the balance for him. Uh, but it's going to be it's going to be a big argument because while there's great deference to the president on what constitutes a national emergency, he already sort of tipped his hand by saying, "I didn't have to do this." Yeah, <laughs> and it's interesting that the way that it has been set up. Of course, it was set up so that the president wasn't like a king; right. couldn't just come in and yeah. exercise um, authority like that. But of course, all the th I mean, he has demonstrably lied consistently throughout his presidential term. Um, but that doesn't seem to matter to his supporters, the people who got there, because he's a demagogue. He's a very passionate, charismatic individual, and he um, appeals to that. What this is really interesting in, the, in that it reveals is how, how little of a politician within the political ranks he is. So mm -hmm. he's, he's treating the government as he treated his own personal the Trump empire as a business where mm -hmm. he is the CEO mm -hmm. and he can exactly. say and do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. And that model probably does resonate with his supporters, but of course the government is very specifically set up so that that's not possible. Right. And I think when we look back in 10, 15 years time at Trump's legacy, it will be his own party that actually be the, is the one that, that has the brakes on him mm -hmm. and, and hopefully from our perspective, from my particular perspective, because he's a very anti-feminist um, leader and sends very w worrying messages about women, etc. So that, I'm, you know, I'm not ne neutral on Trump. No feminist is. Um, <laughs> but it will be that political process mm. that ends up either curtailing him or bringing him down. It won't be the popular vote. When? How quickly? Ah, uh, well, the wheels of justice are quite slow <laughs> sometimes. Um, but the thing is that, you know, he's looking, all presidents, first-term presidents are looking to how you, they get to be second-term yeah. presidents. And um, it's that where it'll start mm. really, really showing yeah. when we come up to, to the primaries on that, right. how yeah. much his own party is willing to support him. Of course, what the Democrats do, you know, what they put up, they cannot put up another Hillary. They absolutely cannot put up an another Hillary. But when we look at the people who are putting themselves forward to go up against him, they are in that mold that will very much appeal to Democrat voters. But I'm not at all convinced mm. it's going to appeal to the people who voted for Trump. So um, is it possible, though, that we won't have to wait for the Republicans to do as Kirsten said? Um, because there is, of course, the uh, Mueller investigations going mm. on at the moment. And there have been some developments with Paul Manafort. Well, I mean, yes, he's he's been found to repeatedly have lied. I mean, he's he's playing for a, a presidential pardon, which is one of the powers of the presidency. Uh, and and Trump has not been shy about sort of waving that around as 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 a, a bypass to cover himself. Um, but 
thus far, um, there has been very little that has uh, has aroused the Republican Party to 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 break ranks with the president. Um, now you do see some of this on Russia on policy on the policy side of trying to limit his ability to uh, you know, to withdraw from NATO, for example, and such things. But when it comes down to will he pay a political price in the immediate term prior to the 2020 elections, will there be an impeachment effort? Um, impeachment starts in the House of Representatives, which the Democrats control, but it's voted upon in the Senate, which right. the Republicans control. Mm -hmm. So depending on what's revealed, I mean, theoretically it's possible, but it's very hard to be confident that it will rise to that level um, uh, given past practice over the past two years of the Republican yeah. Party, because uh, they're just too afraid of his base. Yeah. 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 Well, we can live in hope. Um, yeah, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Shamina Begum now has been in the news this week. She was a 15 year old schoolgirl who went to join ISIS, um, is now 19, I think, mm -hmm. and Sorry. she's in a refugee camp and she is nine months pregnant and wants to come home. What, uh, what, have you th what are your thoughts on this, Kirsten? Well, it's interesting that we actually, as the public, have no idea what what prompted her to go out and join ISIS. It's highly likely, knowing um, the way in which um, those kinds of organisations run, and particularly how they treat women, that she was coerced or at least abused. Um, we don't know any of that, um, but she is a British citizen. And what I would say, as a feminist, as someone who, but also someone who doesn't know the background, is that she should have the right to return and face trial. Because if things have been going on that have meant that she has been coerced, abused, etc., then in a British uh, court system she would be able to present that evidence as mitigating mm. and, and we would see justice done. There's no way we can do that while she's out there. Mm. And we've seen several ISIS um, and, and Daesh um, supporters return to the UK. Mm -hmm. I think something like 19 or 20 of them have come back, mm -hmm. have faced trial. All of them have been men so far. Mm -hmm. This is unusual in that it, this is the first um, female who's, who's wanted to come home. Um, and I also think the duty of care, given that, that she's pregnant, yeah. um, should indicate that we should be exercising some kind of compassion here. Mm. Um, but there is this very strong, and uh, certainly the social media presence that is saying that, you know, she is obviously a terrorist and therefore she should uh, face, um, you know, there's no way we repatriate terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we do when it suits us and when we want information from them. <laughs> so why not do it for a good reason <laughs> rather than for a kind of ethically questionable reason, I would have said. It was interesting actually watching some of the Vox Pops on mm. this and there were lots of views on it um, and, and I, I uh, was in Manchester this week so local news Vox Pops had a lot of young Muslim uh, girls who were saying uh, either that no, she shouldn't be able to mm. come back or if she does, she must face trial. Yeah. But one of the things that, that was an issue for people um, throughout the week and when it was discussed on just about every TV programme possible. One of the issues was that she had apparently, in her one interview that she's done, she'd not condemned mm. ISIS and said that she didn't so regret. Bear in mind, she's 19 years old, mm. she didn't mm. regret. So can you see the argument that some people are, you know, saying, well, you know, be sorry before you can come back? Well, I mean, the, a lot of young Muslim women would push back against the idea that she's been abused and that she's been forced into this because they would say actually we have agency we actually have the capacity to decide this for mm. ourselves and if we decide that we actually do believe these things then we have the capacity and the right to go out and just as our brothers do to go out and, and fight this kind of thing i don't think that undermines the the social justice argument that this is a british citizen asking to come home um, I would be very, very cautious of any kind of conditional you come home if yeah. you say you don't believe this or that and the other. This is very, we're varying horribly into 1984 territory mm. here. If she comes home and she has committed um, an offence and she has joined a banned organisation and then she should pay the price for that. You know, she is a, a, 
a grown adult now. She can she has capacity to make these mm. decisions. She certainly, if she can be asking to come home, she's got the capacity to stand trial. Um, and I always come back to this around kind of Emily and Pankhurst, deeds not words kind of thing. We do know that language leads to radicalisation and the way you talk about things is important. But at the same time, um, you kind of need to judge people particularly on their actions because all of us know, I mean, our private opinions or, or whatever could absolutely get us into awful, awful trouble. This has become a very public opinion and she acted on, on, on this belief, um, whether she was coerced or not, we, yeah. as I said, we don't know. But it would seem to be the social justice thing to do. If we're going to say that we as a, a civilian society are better than ISIS, are better than these forces that want to bring us down, oh, wow. then we have to put our money where our mouth is and say, right, well, this is due process, this is justice, this is what okay. Western justice looks like. Yeah. These are the laws that you've broken. You come back and you answer for them. We also will look after you. Mm -hmm. You will look after your baby and all of these kinds of things because that is our way of living that you want to attack. Um, and, and we can't say, okay, you know, thought crimes, etc. we will just treat you like that because that's just falling into um, organisations' yeah. hands. You know, that, yeah. that's the kind of radical changing in, change in thinking that they want to see us doing. Mm. Um, and we need to, if we're going to defend democracy, if we're going to defend this, we need to actually do something practical to do it. Kurt. I, I, I largely agree with that. I mean, I think, I, I think it's also interesting that the former intelligence chief has said she should be, you know, in an yeah. article yeah. in The Guardian said she should be allowed to come back and, and, and face charges if those, mm. those, those pertain. And I'm sure there's probably investigative efforts going on right now to see what exactly she did because the, the name of her Dutch convert husband is known and so forth. Um, so we have that, uh, as, but there's also, um, and this is, doesn't change the, the, the subtext here, but the Quilliam Foundation that looks at how do you reintegrate people who yeah. been yeah. radicalized, said she's probably, if what she is quoted as having said is representative of her view, which we can't know until you know she gets back and maybe mm. then she's probably going to be a particularly hard case to, to deprogram. Mm. Um, but I don't think that that negates the idea that she should she should be she should be repatriated to face judicial charges and, mm. and not left in, in in the last you know enclave. I think the most surprising thing in all of this for me this week was I watched part of Question Time. And Jacob Rees-Mogg was actually very sympathetic to that view as well. Mm. I mean, I think apart from anything else, you can't, if she can get here, you can't stop her because she, you can't That's leave her awesome. stateless. Mm. No. But he said something that sounded almost like compassion. He said she was 15. She mm. was likely abused um, mm. to, to get to that stage. She's had two babies die mm. and she's now having another baby and you've got to have sympathy for her. And I nearly fell on the floor when I heard him saying that. But um, yeah, it was an interesting debate. And actually, I think the whole tone of the debate, well, that I've seen has been fairly measured. I think, I think so. And even a stop clock is right twice a day. So <laughs> let's give Jacob Rees-Mogg a little bit of credit. But it's absolutely right. She was very young. And we look at, you know, when people are trafficked or when people are forced into marriages and, and young girls, etc. They do, they are absolutely incredibly vulnerable mm. at that point. Um, because they are, because usually... Um, sort of all the systems around them that should protect them are actually pushing them further into danger. Um, and we've got things in place to stop young girls being forced to go abroad for female genital mutilation, for forced marriages, for things like that. Now, anything that was in place to prevent her from becoming radicalised and going abroad to enter in that obviously either wasn't in place or didn't work kind of thing. But that doesn't mean we lose the duty of care four years on. No. Um, and I think, you know, absolutely, those are, those are horrendous things that would have happened, would have derailed anybody. And a 15-year-old girl far from home, etc., is needs support. Even if she is, then turns out to be somebody who faces charges and is found guilty, she still needs support. Mm. We would support her within the system if she was here. There were some other young people who were hitting the headlines this week um, and that was the young school pupils who went out on strike 
to campaign for climate change to be taken more seriously, more or less. Uh, but not everybody thought it was a, a positive thing. I shall, I'll, I shall read you the tweet from Christopher Hope who, uh, of the Daily Telegraph. And he said, around 2,000 sixth formers who bunked off school have been protesting in Parliament Square, bearing in mind these protests took place across the UK. Right. They've now wrecked the newly planted grass and they are worried about climate change. What about the lawn? What about the lawn, what Kirsten? About the lawn? I hope he was clutching his pearls when he said that. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I've had my own Twitter spat with Dan Hodges about this um, in terms of there's a lot, the social media divided completely on this. On the one side, we had some very right wing journalists and for some reason, Tory office Central HQ seemed to think it was a good idea to call these young people who are just about able to vote next time um, truants rather than strikers. So way to appeal to your young mm. voter base. Um, but uh, the, the argument I had was because he'd said, oh, they're supposed to be in school learning what they're told. As an educator, um, particularly an educator in social sciences, I think one day of active citizenship like this is probably worth at least 10 days in the classroom. Mm. Um, as somebody who cares about climate change, there won't be a lawn at all there if we carry on <laughs> and don't do anything about it. Um, and we do see, I mean, young people are very radical, no matter what generation. Mm. We were all very radical when we were young. And if you look at sort of the things that my generation were radical about when we were at school, it was also about climate change. Then it was acid rain, and that was the thing mm. that was going mm. to kill us all, or the whole hole in the ozone layer. And now it's climate change. But we were also very politically engaged. So it was my generation that marched on the Berlin Wall and brought it down. Huge, huge social and political change for Europe that came yeah. out of that. My generation and, and parents who, who were marching against the poll tax in the UK. That had a huge impact both on getting rid of the poll tax but also being the first real um, attack that was actually successful politically in a civic way against the Tory government. I thought for a there. moment there, Kirsten, you said my parents' generation <laughs> on the poll tax and I thought, oh, that'll be me then. <laughs> well, no, that was, I mean, the, the poll tax was, was something that did cross, it wasn't just young people, that yeah, was yeah. something that did appeal to, to, but, you know, those young people will grow up and they'll get more conservative with a small c. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened with mm. civic uh, engagement. But what was really, really um, exciting about this was that this was led by young people. You know, yeah. this was led by um, Swedish young people who went out and started marching. And it's, you know, there was a fantastic march in Glasgow. As you said, it was all over the country. Um, and it was peaceful uh, and it was, um, there well, was peaceful until the police got involved. Peaceful until the police got involved. And, and there's always dubious things about that because you get headlines when the police get involved. You know, peaceful marches don't get media coverage. So I'm a little mm. bit... I'm going to take right. a step back from how that was kind of managed kind of thing. You know, and the women's movement has always marched mm. and um, hashtag Me Too marches. You know, yeah. I think... You know, things like the women's movement's march and this particular uh, march probably will not have any great immediate impact on policies. But what it will demonstrate is to the people who took part in the march that there are other people that think like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that they got out of their classrooms, they got off their tablets and they went out and physically took part. Yeah. That is the important thing about growing a social movement. People need to feel yeah. that they are not alone, that there are other people that think like that. Yeah. And it was similar with the women's marches. You know, when we all when people were individually tweeting, oh, hashtag me too, but the deluge <coughs> of women uh, that tweeted hashtag me too, and then the deluge of women that turned up to the anti-Trump marches and things like that, was a real sense of, and that's what's re the women's movement. Um, mm. It's that connection with other activists rather than the impact that it has on, on the mainstream political. Yeah. Were you worried about the lawn at all? No, no, no. <laughs> the, the thought I had to what Kirsten just said is, is now that the, the, the social civic activism has a manifestation in, in practice politics. I mean, if you look at the democratic presidential field, I don't know if they're majority women, but to, to my mind they are. Mm. Uh, and and you have a number of, of women who are elected to Congress for the first time with reflecting a broader palette of diversity than we'd seen before. Mm. Uh, mm. Native American elected. Um, it's I, I think I think that this is having a resonance that will have a political impact. It already has a political impact. Um, 
and you know the, this young woman who went to you know the, the, the Swedish high school student who went to went to Davos and, mm. and, and was met by the head of the IMF and 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 it's it's it had it's metastasized in a much broader way, and I think it's going to to force a reflection on the issue, which is going to be deeply uncomfortable for for a lot of people because as you as you extrapolate what kind of change this will mean across our economies politics lifestyle you know financial world it's going to be heavy if we if we want to be serious about dealing with mm. climate change but we can't even begin to have a concrete discussion about it without f forcing it onto the agenda mm -hmm. And that's exactly what those young people were trying to do. Now, I want to um, look at other protests that have been happening um, across the Balkans. And mm. you, Kurt, have some expertise in the background in the Balkans. So do you want to say a little bit about just what's been happening there? Because we've not seen much of it in our media here. No, no, because there's there's a lot of other things that are, that are in the media space. And, and uh, for the longest time, the the Western approach toward the Balkans for at least a decade has been, you know, European Union enlargement is going to solve this. We don't need to really think about the concrete realities or, you know, who our interlocutors are on the other governmental side of this. And uh, that has not worked. No. You have deep political, economic, organized crime nexuses running the shows pretty much across the board in the, in the Western mm -hmm. Balkans. Uh, and now the, the, there's, there's starting to be popular resistance to that uh, against the unresponsiveness and unaccountability of governing elites. Um, this was reinforced during the, during the migration crisis where you, you saw perverse alliances, for example, with, with Nikola Gurevsky, the former prime minister of Macedonia, who's now in, under political asylum in Hungary after being convicted for corruption by the new government, um, that, you know, Sebastian Kurz, now Chancellor of Austria, you know, went down to campaign for him. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have these, the place where it's most broad-based in terms of, of, of coverage is in Serbia, uh, a very heavily centralized country uh, with very little local control. They don't even elect their mayors in Serbia mm -hmm. directly, which is problematic. Really? No. No. And that's, that's different even from Bosnia, where I lived for over a decade. So. This is sort of thrown a wrench into the whole idea that, you know, the, the, the European Union is going to deal with people like Aleksandr Vucic, the president of Serbia, who's, who's trying to partition Kosovo now. And, and so there has been no real Western response. And these governments have been caught flat-footed because they don't mm. really have a response either, other than to say that these people are unpatriotic, which is, you know, the, the first refuge of scoundrels and mm. not just the last one. Mm. And, and, and the, the other thing, it's not just the UK, it's the EU as well that have mm. not responded to it. But the other thing that they don't seem to have much to say about is what's happening in Spain at the moment mm. with the Catalonian politicians. Some of them have been imprisoned for two years and their trials started in the last week, mm. Kirsten. It, it, it's an interesting one, certainly an interesting one from a Scottish perspective, because yeah. of course there are interesting parallels between the Catalonian movement for independence and the Scottish movement for independence. The difference, of course, in Catalonia was there was no constitutional way in which a referendum could legally be held. Um, and so the Catalonians went ahead. And I remember actually working with a, a colleague at Barcelona University. We were both looking at the way in which the women's movement has an impact on independence movements. Um, and I remember her saying, well, if we hold one, what are they going to do? Are they going to arrest us? And it was almost a joke yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And as I watched it unfold, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. I mean, we saw a, a grassroots, you know, obviously not legal referendum happen, happen relatively peacefully until the Spanish police got involved. And then we see the arrest of politicians, academics, movement builders, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know... Uh, Nicola Sturgeon sent messages um, of, of uh, um, support. Um, St Andrews, we've we've been mm -hmm. supporting, you know, and, and uh, um, legally supporting somebody who um, would be nominally standing trial if she was out there, yeah. kind of thing. So, so Scotland has been 
lovely in terms of that. <laughs> Iceland, as well, has mm. kind of recognised the, the Catalonian independence movement. But the EU as a whole has been remarkably silent. Mm. And it's interesting because the EU as a whole has always said it will not interfere in what it calls internal political affairs. Um, it's, it's an economic and political cooperative Union. Mm. It is not about, and the same, the United Nations also tries to make that distinction between internal political um, issues. But we are seeing, I think, quite almost civic rights abuses here, you know, the kind mm. of right to a fair trial, etc., and all of those kind of things. Um, and the EU silence on that, if you are silent, then you are consenting and you are actually supporting the status quo. So they're supporting a quite a hard-hitting regime in terms of the way. Now, there are lots of things that they could have done in Spain to manage the mm. Catalonian process, yes. politically, ethically, etc. and they've chosen to be very kind of hardline about it. Mm. You would understand, though, that, um, you know, if the EU, and like the UN, as you said, say we won't interfere in internal matters, but is, is there a, a, a line that you just can't go beyond where you really must speak out? Well, I mean, I think, I think the question is a, is a fundamental rights question. I mean, the, 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 the most distressing part of this whole trajectory for me is that now you finally have, uh, as of June last year, a government in Spain under Prime Minister Sanchez who's, who's demonstrated uh, quite a different attitude than the government that was in power when the, the Catalans uh, held their, their unconstitutional referendum. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's just the, the clock of, of uh, this, budget, this budget discussion uh, and vote was coterminous with the beginning of the trial of these, these 12, 12 people uh, who, who had held the referendum. And that forced the government to collapse. The likely result of this will be bringing in a far-right party that is not represented in, in Parliament now, Vox. For the longest time, Spain was sort of seen as an anomaly in a good way that it did not have far-right populism because they actually had fascism. Mm. And uh, that was considered a no-go area. So this, this party has risen up in part because of the natural... You know, nationalist on nationalist radicalization that you know Europe throughout Europe, particularly in the Balkans recently, but it's a commonality. Uh, these people need each other, mm -hmm. and and Rajoy, when he was prime minister in Spain, helped feed what ultimately led to the the Catalan independence referendum. I, I think that 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 you know that's a counterfactual. You can't you you'd have to hop in a time machine to be able to determine. You know what the co what the course would have been otherwise, yeah. but that's that that makes it very difficult. And and I think that given Brexit and given the rise of right wing populism mm -hmm. it, throughout Europe, there's a there's a sense we don't want to touch this with a ten foot pole unless there's some real extreme violations of human rights. Mm -hmm. And as you see in Hungary and in Poland, mm -hmm. you have member states that are in open contravention yes. of European standards. Yeah. And there are no consequences. So I don't think this should be all that surprising. Mm. I think if we if we want to bring it back to the lessons we could learn from that within the Scottish context, mm. um, there's a strong push at the moment between some arms of the of the independence movement for a unilateral declaration of independence mm. or for uh, a referendum, etc. And that. I mean, the Catalonian experience shows what happens when you hold an illegal referendum or you attempt something like a yeah. unilateral. It would be an absolute disaster. And, and I don't think it would take Scotland with it. So uh, it would be that kind of thing as well. But also another interesting parallel, of course, we've been talking about the rise of the far right. Um, and a lot of independence movements are categorised or, or, or sort of demonized by the mainstream as being far-right movements, whereas Catalonia and Scotland, they're not. Yeah. They're not ethnic, they're not, it's not an ethnic movement, it's a civil idea about independence and it's a civil idea about identity and in fact it's mostly left-wing within mm. Catalonia and it was a, that pushback against, as Kurt said, you know, long history of fascism, fascism in Spain that they didn't want, they saw signs of coming back and they really didn't want imposed on them. Uh, similarly, the, the Scottish movement for independence is much more a kind of civic nationalism. It's not a mm. blood and Even soil so. type nationalism. It's not who you, you know, you live here and your clan 
kind of thing. There is a small wing of it that is that, but that's blown out of all proportion. Yeah. It's mainly a civic nationalism, as it is in Catalonia, and as it is in other independence movements throughout Europe that are not actually about ethnicity, about yeah. blood and soil, but they're actually about a pushback against neoliberal governments and against the, the perception that we have all moved politically towards things like Brexit, towards things that are about national identity and a much more right-wing discourse within mm -hmm. mainstream politics. Mm. Um, and that's much more kind of a, a complex political situation to be in. Yeah, yeah. And, and although we're saying that, you know, there's been very few people, the EU haven't had much to say about Catalonia and what's happening there, there's been plenty of comments online and what people seem to be saying is whether you support independence for Catalonia or not, you know, this is not right. Mm. And imagine it happened here. Now, what you've just mm. said, we should say that there are two schools of thought on that. Some people think we should go ahead with an advisory mm. referendum, but other people, you know, saying, mm. no, don't look what happened in Catalonia. Mm. But can, you know, I think it would really bring it home if that, if we did and it happened here, it's unthinkable. And that's why we probably should be more shocked than we are at what's happening in Catalonia mm. now. But I think this comes back to what Kristen said about the long game that uh, I, the, the, the SNP, from my perspective, has been playing on, on the Brexit issue uh, and where it plays into the long-term agenda of Scottish independence. I mean, there were a number of people, uh, probably a deciding strand of your, of your population, who, when they looked at the economics or whatever, on whatever basis, decided, decided not with a great deal of passion to vote no. Mm. Uh, it's a different equation if you have a hard Brexit, mm. and uh, I think I think that there are a lot of NHS S Scottish nationalists uh, in that regard, uh, uh, civic of the civic variety, who are not for separation per se, but if they're going to be hived off from the mm. European continent, yeah. it's it's a very different argument. So I would differentiate um, that. From I, I think I think you'd be turning into the fishtail. You'd actually be doubling down on on separating yourself from a lot of supportive opinion uh, on the European continent. And if the goal of, of an independent Scotland for those who espouse this is to be integrated mm. in in Europe, uh, that is going to burn a lot of bridges if mm. if that were the path to go down. Whereas if it's visited upon Scotland by London against popular will, you have a different you're looking at a different equation entirely. If you look at the people who voted no in, in 2014, um, apart from the people who would always have voted no, uh, the ones that, that would have been to play for and ended up going for no, risk was the big thing that turned them off, mm -hmm. the whole idea. Um, and the uncertainty over currency, uncertainty over the economic future, uncertainty right. over the EU, ironically, um, <laughs> uncertainty over what would happen to the NHS. And there was a lot of stuff being bandied around, which as a social policy person, I found really, really annoying about you're going to lose your pension and you're going to lose this, that and the other, you know, and that was kind of quite a lot of scare tactics. So people voted for the status quo because they didn't want risk. Now, Brexit, particularly a no-deal Brexit, is a huge risk, yeah. absolutely huge yeah. risk. Um, and I think there is some, and uh, certainly within the kind of dubious, you know, middle ground people to, to play for, rather than the hardliner independence movement, who are now saying, actually, the risk of being part of the UK mm. is actually greater. Mm. For several reasons, it's not just Brexit. It's, it's the idea that something happened that was totally against their own perception of what they thought should happen and are against the Scottish interest as well, has happened. Um, and it's happened because of the way in which the votes went in England, yeah. basically. It's an English, uh, it's, it's an English issue. Um, Wales, although it did vote slightly for, um, uh, for Brexit, has now, the Welsh Assembly has now voted against um, taking, particularly against a hard Brexit. Northern Ireland... <laughs> We won't even go there, we haven't got time, but definitely <laughs> wanted to stay in the EU for very, very good reasons. And one of the mm. sh most shocking things to me was that the politicians involved did not realise the implications for the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. And then when they did realise the implications of it, acted as though it didn't matter. Mm. Right. 
I'm of the generation that remembers. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, this is the first, young people today are the first generation in Northern Ireland who have grown up without um, guns on the streets and without violence. We cannot, we cannot mm -hmm. go back there. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we would go back there with a no-deal no Brexit for some kind for blue passports and some kind of mythical mm. empire, which seems to be what's driving the, the, the rhetoric behind that kind of thing. But also they're looking at, you know, not all people who voted for independence would have voted to stay in the EU. But they're much mm. more looking at an idea of actually these kinds of decisions would be better off taken at a Scottish level. Mm. That actually I want to campaign against things to Holyrood, to a responsive mm. government, rather mm. than this very distant mm. Westminster well, government, which one, isn't representative of how mm. I vote. One example of that, I don't know if you, either of you saw the Home Office tweet that they sent out on Valentine's Day. It was a rehash of one that had happened when Theresa May was the Home Secretary. Mm. Basically, it was hashtag roses are red, violets are blue. If your marriage is a sham, we're coming after you. Happy Valentine's Day. So I tweeted them back and said, roses are red, or viol violets are blue. My friend's marriage broke up because of you. Mm. And it got a real response, as mm. did their tweet. And I think most people in Scotland are seeing now that in actual fact, it'd be a very different attitude coming from our government. But even if it wasn't a different attitude, it'd be a bit easier to persuade the Scottish government of a smaller country to change tack. Immigration is a really good example of this because Scotland needs immigration. You know, we've got an ageing population. England does we, too. We, uh, well, England does too, but England doesn't accept so much right, that exactly. it needs immigration. <laughs> it thinks it's got a, you know, anyway. Um, but certainly even the Scottish Tories accept that we need immigration. Yeah. Um, and therefore, and in fact, when we looked at some work post uh, the Scottish independence referendum, what powers should be devolved? We were helping support the Smith Commission around that. One of the issues was around, yeah, immigration, because there are certain areas in the economy that need in immigration. Um, we've got a much more of an ageing population. We've mm. got that inverse care thing going on in Scotland. But also there is a sense of, and you can see this in the, the powers that were devolved, in the in the social in the kind of social um, democracy and and the kind of the, the welfare powers that were devolved, that Scottish people have a different sense of what social security should be, mm. of what welfare should be. See the difference in health policy; mm. they've got a different sense of that and a different sense of what social care policy should be. Yeah. And they are becoming, even if they're not pro independence, they would be pro what they would see as Devo Max. That Scotland should have more control over mm. these areas. And of course, Brexit. Again, it's just thrown risk back into it. Yeah. I mean, there's 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 a there's a thread that's run through our discussion here. I mean, I think I think central governments have, have bred separatism mm. throughout throughout Europe and 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 pushes pushes for greater local control, whether that be manifest as independence. Uh, you, I've heard Scots since I've lived here for the past two and a half years complain that that, that the Scottish government is yeah. not devolved enough. Yeah. Uh, in terms of local control and, and councils and so forth, mm. so there's there's that as well, uh, and and there's a problem with coalition governments, that that you know the DUP is part of the reason why we're still stuck with with uh, on this this juggernaut toward a hard Brexit, and and the coalition government in Spain that because it relied on Catalan mm -hmm. nationalists, mm -hmm. that's why it fell, mm. uh, and why they're going to have early elections now, mm. so um, this is this is part of. Uh, there's a there's a common gravitational pull toward greater local control and accountability uh, that unfortunately populists are capitalizing on but have made no real prescriptions on how to actually address mm. in a functional way. Mm. Yeah. And um, so, sorry, I was just going to say in terms of, um, I would counter. I would. It's the first time I've disagreed with Kurt. Okay. Actually, the entire program. No. So give me <laughs> give me a minute. It's about coalition governments mm -hmm. because I mean, Holyrood is set up to be a coalition and it's very difficult to win a majority. The whole way in which proportional representation, etc., works there. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that is more responsive, actually, mm -hmm. because people have to find and negotiate uh, and cooperate. Westminster is not set up for a coalition. 
So we saw the disaster of the uh, Conservative and, and Liberal Democrats, and now we're seeing the disaster of yeah. the... So it's that difference in, in the accountability that I think can make a real difference and might make a real difference to the way Scottish people think politically. Mm. So, well, we've got one more thing to talk about. We have two minutes left, and I just want uh, to mention we talked last week about question time. Mm -hmm. The week before last, when it was in Motherwell, and the, the UKIP candidate who keeps reappearing... Mm. And this week, we've had an admission that he, well, from him, that he was actually invited. He didn't apply to go on. Mm. They sought him out and asked him to come on because they couldn't find enough right-wing views in Motherwell. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> um, <laughs> good old Motherwell. Um, the thing about Question Time is it's an entertainment programme. You know, it is set up by the production team to be argumentative. Um, it's not representative of what people think, and it's certainly not representative of the political spectrum. If you look at how often UKIP has been on compared to the Greens or the SNP, etc. Yeah, yeah. But that they are openly stating that they deliberately put a provocative person in mm -hmm. at least four times is a new bit of, of information on the way in which the BBC operates. And I think then, most people were quite surprised and shocked yeah, by that. And then finally, Kurt, the latest development is that they've admitted that they, I think they've admitted, but apparently they cut down this very long diatribe against the SNP. Fiona Hislop was able to respond and they edited her response down to seven seconds. It's, it's, it's the media spectacle element that uh, for, for, for ratings and then this is this is how you got a president from because he knew how to he knew how to master that approach toward uh, which is not representative of the general opinion but it amplifies a certain constituency yeah. that's completely disconnected from actually coming up with solutions to, to issues that do affect the and there is independent research on this. The way in which Jeremy Corbyn is portrayed in the media oh, yeah. is constantly, this has been showed by work done at LSE, is constantly critical and, mm. and right-wing commentators are always given more airtime. Yeah. And it's interesting that they always complain that they, you know, whoever's the government in, in power says oh, the, the opposition is always given far too much airtime. I don't mm. think that's the case at the moment. This has been a no. real eye-opener for the way in which the BBC operates. And that's why it's great that Broadcasting Scotland and other mm. outlets uh, are appearing and that's why it's great that people like yourselves are kind enough to give up your Sunday morning. I understand you left Dundee at 8 o'clock this morning. Close uh, to it, yeah. Oh goodness, no. That's all right. It's I wasn't even awake at that ride. time. <laughs> 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 but thank you both, Kirsten Rummery and Kurt thank Bassina. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for, for your time today and join us again next week for the Full Scottish. Thank you for watching.